enough of that. I'm going to turn my clock back here. How many folks remember in the early 90s Chuck Harder for the People Radio Network? How many folks remember him? Oh, okay, some of you do. Well, I will tell you, Chuck Harder served in an ins as an inspiration for uh, not only myself, but my wife, Joyce Riley, and many others. He used to say, become a committee of one. He used to say that if you can, if, you're, uh, if you have the gift of gab, and you've got the persistence, he says, get your own radio show on a local station. And I thought about it. I've been in involved in uh, announcing and voiceovers and music and recording and radio f since the mid-70s. I said, yeah, I'm going to get my own radio talk show. It took me about two years of uh, persistent door knocking and being a squeaky wheel, but I eventually ended up on a radio station in Waterbury, Connecticut at WATR AM 1420. And uh, I used the air name of Dave Riddell. Because the program director, you know, he knew what I was talking about. He says, Dave, last name like Von Kleist, you know. There's not too many Von Kleists out there. All they got to do is get a phone book. They're going to find you, your wife, your kid, you know, whatever. Use an air name like many of the other, other talk show hosts do. I said, okay. So I chose my grandmother's maiden name. It had so, sort of rolled tri trippingly off the tongue. Dave Riddell, yeah. So that's the air name that I used, and I went on, and I was just banging the drum long and loud against all this main, you know, all, all the stuff that the mainstream wasn't talking about. And here comes the Oklahoma City bombing. You know, I mean, we have so many innocent men, women, and children killed on that day. And what was the mainstream network shoving down your throat 24-7, 365? It was O.J. Simpson. Some of the other radio stations were doing 15-minute OJ updates. When they tuned into our station, I say, ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for an OJ update, turn the dial. Welcome to No J Radio. <laughs> I say, yeah, it's terrible that two people were murdered and they think that OJ did it or whether he did or he didn't, but that's not the point. The point is, is we have a whole lot more people, innocent people, that were blown to pieces in Oklahoma City and the mainstream media is not talking about it. So I spent weeks focusing on the Oklahoma City bombing and brought on many different people, and one of which is our next presenter. He is a former head of the uh, FBI offices in, uh, in uh, um, thank you, Memphis. Thank you, down, right here, hometown. And Ted Gunderson was one of the few voices screaming from the rooftops about what was going on in Oklahoma City. I had him on as a guest on my program about uh, 12, 13 years ago. And it's a pleasure to shake his hand. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ted Gunderson. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, I'm from Plano. Is anybody here from Plano? Raise your hand. Uh, can you give me a ride home after the show? <laughs> FBI. Okay. Now, I wasn't sure what I was supposed to talk about until I saw the program here about a week or so ago because I have probably six or eight topics I can discuss. Oklahoma City bombing, 911, World Trade Center, 93, and the list goes on and on. Satanic cults. And uh, I was chosen and asked to talk about the great FBI. I was an FBI agent, uh, including uh, a chief, for some 27 years. I was a brick agent. They call it brick agent, meaning you're on the street investigating and so forth. For 10 years, and then I rose up through the ranks. And when I retired, I was in charge of the LA Bureau, which is most of Southern California. I had over 700 personnel under my command. I had a, a budget of $22.5 million. Um, I had 16 offices I was responsible for, big operation. And, uh, and then uh, in 1979, I was 50 years old, and now you can figure out how old I am now. And uh, I knew mandatory retirement was 55, so I decided to retire. But in the interim, those 27 years, I handled just about everything, counter-espionage in New York. Um, I was in uh, New Haven, Connecticut number two man when the Panthers were running wild there. And after the Panthers were dead, gone, and out, uh, I was responsible for coordinating uh, 
information on the Bobby Seale trial. He was tried for murder in New Haven and so forth. A lot, of, a lot of details on that. I haven't got time to go into a lot of details personally right now today, but I had a call from William C. Sullivan, who was number two man in the FBI at the time, and Bill was a friend of mine. He said, Ted, I attribute the downfall of the Black Panther Party directly to you and your squad in the New Haven Police Department. And they were a bunch of vicious, mean people. They wanted to take over the government through force. They were taking over college administrations, for those of you who are too young to remember that. And uh, so we had our heyday with them. And while I was in New Haven, you know, Yale University's in New Haven. And I attended this cocktail party one day, and I saw this fellow across the room, and he was dressed with a silk suit and the nicest tie you can imagine. And I ran over to him, I says, uh, you're from Yale University, you went to Yale University, didn't you? And he said, yes, well, how did you know that? And he says, uh, I said, well, I saw your, you know, your nice suit, your tie and everything. He says, well, you graduated from the University of Nebraska, didn't you? And I said to him, well, how did you know that? He said, I read it on your ring when you're picking your nose. <laughs> That's not a true story, really. I don't pick my nose. But uh, I ran the gamut. Uh, in uh, July 12, 1972. I'm telling you the story because I want you to know I have credibility. And when I get up here and tell you what I'm going to tell you after this, I can document it. And I've spent the last 28, 29 years of my life doing just that. I spend my retirement money on trying to wake up America. Okay. But, beg your pardon, sir? Yeah. But um, I ran the gamut in the FBI. Uh, July 12, 1972, I negotiated with two terrorists who had taken over National Airlines Flight 496 at Philadelphia International Airport. Successfully, I was able to get the release of 113 passengers. Uh, I picked up a 10 most wanted in Connecticut at one time. I worked General Criminal Communist Party USA. I, I did everything in my day. It was a fantastic career. The FBI in my day, very frankly, was the greatest law enforcement investigative agency in history, okay? Bar none, no question about it. J. Edgar Hoover was a great man. Uh, people asked me, was he gay? And I, my answer to that is, well, I had a half a dozen meetings with him. I'm not a bad looking guy, he never put a move on me, right? <laughs> so no, I don't think he was gay. I don't know, of course. Oh, thanks. Russ, he's a friend of mine. I've known him for years. When I was here in Dallas back in umpteen years ago, uh, he and I did some conferences together. But uh, another case that I worked that I find very interesting, and I think you'll find it interesting, this big six foot five, 255 pound, this is when I was in the FBI, came into the supermarket and he went over to this kid polishing apples in the produce department. The kid was working there and didn't pay any attention to him. And the big guy says, uh, kid, I want a half head of lettuce. And the kid says, uh, we don't sell a half head of lettuce. And the guy taps him, the kid on the shoulder, he says, I want a half head of lettuce. Kid looks at me, he says, just a minute, sir, I'll be right back. I'm going back and talk to the manager. Says, just wait here. Well, he ran back to talk to the manager, didn't realize this big fellow had followed him back here, and he runs up to the manager, he says, there's some dumbass out here who wants a half head of lettuce. And he realized this fellow behind him, and he says, and this gentleman wants the other half. So the manager, uh, the manager says, you know, this guy's got a great future with our organization. I want to find out more about him. So he runs up the kid later in the day. He says, kid, I like the way you handle yourself. You've got a great future with us. Uh, where are you from? The kid says, well, I'm from Maslin, Ohio. Nothing but uh, football players and prostitutes come from Maslin. And the manager says, well, my wife's in Maslin. The kid says, oh, what position does she play? Now we gotta get down to serious business, FBI. FBI was a great organization in its day, okay? I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, they've been infiltrated, and no question about it in my mind, by the Illuminati. I think if you've been here in this conference for two days, everybody knows what the Illuminati is, yeah. right? And there's no question they have been infiltrated by the Illuminati, okay? Now, right after I retired, by the way, I had no idea. I never heard the name Illuminati when I was in the FBI. You see, there's an overt, covert operation of the government, and I've learned this since I got out. 
I was a member of the overt operation. These are the guys with the suit and tie going at the bank robbery and ask <clears throat> what did the bank robber look like and so forth. The covert operation, which is running amok, involves assassinations, murders, burglaries, kidnapping children. I've learned this since I got out. And it goes on and on and on. It involves illegal drugs. And those who have stepped forward to try to identify it and document it, like Gary Webb, who identified South Central CIA drug operation, uh, have paid the price. Gary Webb, by the way, if you don't know, I'm sure you do. He was the reporter for San Jose Mercury News who committed suicide. He was shot head twice in the head. He shot himself twice in the head, right? <laughs> and there was another gentleman who tried to take on the government, the covert government operation, General Ombi, who had exposed the largest drug, you haven't heard this story, drug operation out of Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He worked late one night, didn't come home. The next morning they found him hung with his jacket very neatly stacked next to him. His ties were, his hands were tied behind him. And, um, and they said it was suicide. Now the question is, did he tie his hands behind him before or after he hung himself, right? But this has gone, been going on now. To my knowledge, there have been hundreds, hundreds of us, those who have stepped forward, trying to expose these or horrible, ugly crimes by this covert operation who have paid the price. So uh, my first major investigation, I'm gonna have to touch on uh, some of my cases very lightly because there's too much time. I just spent this morning, I was an hour, whole hour discussing the Franklin cover-up case. I was involved in that. But my first major investigation as a private professional investigator, before I go any further, let me tell you, there's a lot of good people in the FBI, CIA, NSA, military intelligence, a lot of good people. But the problem is the leadership at the top, okay? And this goes right up to the White House. So my first major investigation is the Dr. Jeffrey R. McDonald case. He's a former Green Bay doctor who was tried and convicted, sentenced to three consecutive life sentences for murdering, supposedly, his wife and two children, Fort Bragg, February uh, 17th, 1970. Fort February, yeah, 17th, 1970. Um, I was asked to enter the case as a private professional investigator, and I did. Within 10 months, I obtained a signed confession. Now, we're talking about the FBI, and when I'm telling you about the FBI, I'm talking, I'm gonna take cases, several cases that I've worked personally. So I'm a unique individual. I not only have done the research, I've been on the streets. We call it uh, been in the trenches. So in this case, of course, I was in the trenches. And within 10 months, I obtained a signed confession from a girl named Helena Stokely, who said that Dr. McDonald did not commit those murders. They were committed by her satanic cult group. And of course, I'd heard about Satan in the Bible, but I really didn't know that much about it. And uh, so uh, then I started doing my research, and I went public with my confession uh, from Helena. And uh, I was on radio, television, and so forth, and people came to me from all parts of the country, West Coast, East Coast, telling me the same basic story, and I'm saying, well, there must be something to it. Uh, long story short, on the McDonald case, I developed 19 new witnesses, which included my confession from Lena Stokely. And then at that point, up to that point, this army had conducted the investigation. It was a huge cover-up, huge drug cover-up, and Lena told me this. They were flying drugs in plastic bags in the body cavities of the dead GIs in military planes coming into Fort Bragg and around the country. For documentation, I went to UCLA Library, in addition to having this statement from Helena, and I learned that there was an article by Time Magazine, January 1, 1973, that documented this. So Alina gave me this information. She said there were generals involved, police officers, army enlisted personnel, and so on and so forth. The reason they went in and roughed up Dr. McDonald, got out of hand, they were on drugs. According to Alina, there were seven members of her cult that went in and wiped out the family, it was because Dr. McDonald was moonlighting in a civilian hospital and the GIs were going over there for treatment. They were being turned in and being given dishonorable discharges. Anyway, I developed 19 new witnesses. I submitted a 1,200-page report to the defense team. <clears throat> they ended up submitting it uh, to the Department of Justice. He'd been tried, convicted, so we had to have a hearing. Now, at that point, once I entered the case, 
ex-FBI chief and all that sort of thing. At that point, the FBI entered the case. And up to that point, as I say, the Army had handled the investigation. So instead of the FBI taking my work, my 1,200 pages, and building on the case from what I had done, they started interviewing my witnesses, 19 of them, and tried to get every one of them to recant. So here the taxpayers are paying the FBI agents to go out and recant a case where positive information has been developed. This man is absolutely innocent. And when I learned this, I was really very upset. And as a matter of fact, they even interviewed me. And I had a heyday with them, to be honest with you. Because at the end of my interview, it was being taped, I told them about some criminal violations that had, been, that had occurred, and I wanted them to investigate these other criminal violations, including the kidnapping of children by the CIA, and I'm gonna go into that case in just a minute. Anyway, um, I was shocked, I was surprised, and then they came after me, uh, tried to discredit me, and so on and so forth. I'm gonna discuss that just a little bit later in the lecture. So, by the way, the case today, in 1997, the judge ordered DNA tests. The tests have been completed. Uh, the tests absolutely exonerate Dr. McDonald, establish, prove beyond any question at all that there were other people in the house that night. For example, there was hair fiber with root found under one of the children's fingernails, okay? It was not Dr. McDonald's. That is sitting today. The, the DNA tests were ordered uh, in 97. That today is sitting on the judge's desk. Nobody will move on it. I had a letter from Dr. McDonald just this last week saying he doesn't know what's happening, but they're sitting on it. The whole case is a major cover-up. It involves drugs. CIA drug, army drug operation coming in Southeast Asia. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. We had a hearing on my confessions. Um, I was put on the witness stand. Mr. Brian Murtaugh, the prosecutor, asked me, tried to ask me questions about sex and my sex life and all that, which is zero, by the way. It was then, <laughs> still is, almost. Almost, yeah. It was then, then, okay. <laughs> but I mean, this is irrelevant. And I looked, I looked at McDonald's attorney, I said, <clears throat> well, aren't you gonna object to this? And uh, no response. So that was the first case where I really had a wake up call. That's how I became involved in the movement. 27 years ago, what have you. And then the next case uh, was the Franklin cover-up case. And in that case, I had a call from a fellow named Ed Weaver in Lincoln, Nebraska. He had read about me in a book called The Ultimate Evil, Maury Terry, the author of The Ultimate Evil, uh, who did a book on the Son of Sam murders in New York City, a series of uh, murders that was uh, satanic also, by the way. <laughs> and Maury came to me on the West Coast and I helped him do some of the research uh, a long story there, but I won't go into it. But anyway, Ed Weaver in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, called me. We have a problem here. We have uh, a case that's breaking in Omaha. Uh, they are taking children out of orphanages, foster homes, and Boys Town, driving them to Sioux City, Iowa, 184 miles away, putting them on private jets and flying them to Washington, D.C. for sex orgies with congressmen, senators. And these kids, were being flown back there, these eight, nine, 10 year old children exposed to this, these nefarious activities, these horrible situations. And I was told by Ed Weaver that some of the most prominent individuals in Omaha, Nebraska, and they're, been, they're named in uh, John DeCamp's book, The Franklin Cover-Up, and I'm, I'm out of them, by the way. I got one left and I promised that to somebody, but you can order it through my website, tedgunderson.com, or you can come to my table afterwards and I, you can order it then. But um, the Franklin cover of John DeCamp, who was the sen senator working on this case, uh, wrote this book, The Franklin cover of documents everything. He names the people. Harold Anderson, past publisher of the Omaha World Herald. Bob Wadman, chief of police at the time. The head of the society page of the Omaha World Herald. The, Brandi the heir to the Brandeis fortune in Omaha. Uh, Eugene Mahoney, head of the Nebraska Forestry Service, ex-cop with the Omaha Police Department, vice squad. They're named in this book. And in addition to this, the kids talked about uh, satanic cult activity. They didn't say they were satanic cult, but there, was, there were humans in robes, uh, nude underneath the robes, um, chanting candles, uh, sacrificing uh, animals and, and children and people, uh, which is very common, by the way. 
in this country today, as a result of the work that I've done the last 27, 28 years, I can tell you without any question there are 50 to 60,000 human sacrifices by the cults, satanic cults in this country every year. Okay, there are hundreds of thousands of children who disappear every year because of the satanic movement in this country. But anyway, that, that was part of the Franklin cover-up case. Um, and uh, it was kind of interesting because there's a lot more detail than I can tell you, but as I said, this morning I was interviewed for an hour and discussed the whole case for one solid hour. But it was kind of interesting because uh, to show you the power that these people have, there was a TV crew from a Yorkshire TV came over and uh, for seven months they were in this country interviewing various people. Uh, Paul Bonassi, who was a victim himself. Paul Bonassi, I've got a five hour interview with Bonassi myself, by the way. He's a mind control victim. He's a CIA involved in mind control programs. And Paul was used as a decoy when he was 10, 11, 12 years old to attract other children near the car in parks and shopping malls and so forth. The adults would grab and throw them in the back of the car and they'd be off with them. Johnny Gosh in West Des Moines, Iowa was a, a victim of this. Paul was involved in that kidnapping. Anyway, um, I have a five hour interview with Paul. It's available through my DVDs and I'm, I'm giving away DVDs by the way. And I'll talk to you a little more about that at the end of my lecture. And uh, so Paul was, uh, I've interviewed Paul, I've interviewed Alicia Owens and um, this TV crew from England came over. We couldn't. <laughs> get anybody in the United States to touch this. And so Yorkshire TV came over, seven months, interviewed all these various kids and so forth. And um, so it was listed, the show was listed to be aired in TV Guide, May the 3rd, 1994. Actually in the guide. There were certain members of Congress found out about it, bought up the rights to the show orders all copies destroyed, and it never aired on TV, uh, on national television, although it was supposed to be listed to air on the, um, at 10 p.m. May the 3rd, 1994. Now, here a couple of years ago, I said, well, I've got to get a copy of the TV guide, and John DeCamp had one, he can't find it now, I think somebody stole it from him, to be honest with you. I got to get a copy of the TV Guide. So I ordered a copy of the TV Guide. Here's a page I'm looking at right now on May the 3rd, 1994. It's not listed there. It was not listed there in the copy that I have. It's called Balance of Nature appeared at 10 o'clock on Discovery Channel. So somebody took that TV Guide, that whole book, and had it reprinted so there was no documentation of it. Well, I outfoxed them. I went to the UCLA Library, I went to the, oh, excuse me, I went to the LA Times Library. And I pulled up the TV guide for May the 3rd, 1994, and it's listed. Conspiracy of Silence, that was the show. And I said to myself, well maybe on the East Coast it wasn't listed. I had a friend of mine check the Philadelphia Inquirer, May 3rd, 1994. Conspiracy of Silence, 10 p.m., it's listed there. So that just shows you the power of the, uh, uh, that this Illuminati has, that they do have. The, the, this, the speech last night by uh, Mr. Griff, uh, I think was an excellent one, I enjoyed it. I, I knew a lot of that information, but he kind of expanded on it and helped enlighten me. It's an outgrowth of the Franklin cover-up case. By the way, the FBI's involvement in the Franklin cover-up case. John DeCamp in his book, The Franklin Cover-Up, Chapter 14 is devoted to the FBI's involvement in the case. And in that chapter, I read it, and I was embarrassed for the organization that I once served in and for. And John said, of all the agencies that tried to stop that case from going forward was the FBI. And for documentation, John has a $1 million judgment against Larry King. This is the head of the Franklin Savings and Loan, Larry King, not Larry King Live, this is a black man, and, and John has a $1 million judgment against him, um, and uh, he's standing on a street corner one day in Lincoln, and a stranger walks up to him, stands next to him, and says, if you ever collect that money, you won't live to spend it. John 
one day decides he has to move from Lincoln, get out of town. He's receiving death threats. Uh, two young punks drove up into his front yard in front of his oldest daughter, drove over the family dog back and forth several times, told the daughter, tell your daddy to back off or we'll be doing this to you and your brothers and sisters. So John moved out of Lincoln to Clatonia, Nebraska. Uh, the case is very involved. Um, I, as I said, I work with John and I work with the Nebraska Leadership Conference. Um, I was, uh, on one occasion, I had to meet somebody in Omaha. Omaha is about 55 miles from Lincoln. I was in John's office on a Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. I called, made an appointment at Bohemian Cafe in Omaha to meet this individual. I drove up there, <clears throat> met him about noon. We were going to do some work on the case, uh, going out and check on some kids that uh, were victims of this, uh, this horrible situation. By the way, this is how they tell the congressmen, senators how to vote, right? They blackmail them through sex and drugs. So we had lunch and I went in the car of the, my source, my contact, we went out and did some work, came back at three o'clock. I left, uh, actually a little after three o'clock. And halfway to Lincoln, I'm driving along 75 miles an hour and my right front wheel comes off. And I'm, all of a sudden the car goes like this, lurches forward, to the, falls to the right. I look off to the right and here's my, my wheel spinning about 15 feet in the air. Fortunately, I was able to control the car. Uh, we had the car hauled off and uh, talked to highway patrolman about it. He said, hey, somebody loosened your lug nuts. And also on the left front uh, tire, when we had it hauled in the, for repair, the man said, hey, some of these lug nuts are loosened here, but apparently whoever did this was interrupted. Uh, but uh, John was not too happy about it. I called him immediately. And instead of asking me how you are, Teddy, he said, how's my pickup truck? Well, of course, he, he, wanted, he was concerned about me also. As a result of the Franklin cover-up case, uh, we learned that there's an organization, we meaning John DeCamp, Ed Le Weaver and I, and uh, but before I leave the Frank LeCourup case, let me tell you, Gary Caridori was the investigator before I came along. He was a former highway patrolman. The official photographer of the people, of the group, was a fellow named Rusty Nelson. And I spent quite a few hours with Rusty. In fact, I spent about two and a half months with him on one occasion. Um, and um, Rusty was recruited out of a gay bar in Omaha, and uh, he was a country boy, never saw the bright lights of the big city to speak of, Omaha's not a real uh, metropolitan uh, town, by the way, but it's, it's all right, kind of an overgrown country town. And uh, so they recruited Rusty to take pictures of these activities that were taking place in Washington, D.C., and that's, of course, how they, they frame them. And uh, Rusty was pretty smart about it because uh, they kept control of the film that Rusty had, but he would sneak his own film in every once in a while. He'd take his own pictures, so he had <laughs> a double set of pictures, and he did this for, obviously, his own life insurance policy. And uh, so uh, Gary Caridori was contacted by Rusty. This is just before I came aboard. And uh, Rusty said he'd meet him in Chicago. Actually, Rusty at that time was in Phoenix, Arizona. And he met him in Chicago, gave him these pictures of some of our top political figures having sex with children. Gary and his little 11, 12-year-old boy flew to Chicago on his own private plane, got the pictures. He called Senator Lawrence Schmidt, who was working with John DeCamp, and he said uh, to the senator, I have the smoking gun. And he got on his plane and shortly out of Chicago in Aurora, Illinois, um, his plane blew apart, and a farmer testified he saw a bright flame, and the plane crashed, and Gary Curadori died. The first officer at the scene was a deputy sheriff, and um, he picked up the pictures that were around, strewn about on the ground, and the FBI came along and told him, let me have those pictures. They confiscated the pictures from him, told him not to talk about it. Uh, and the plane was hauled off to a military base. And now Gary's a civilian. Should have gone to a civilian base. It was hauled off to a military base. The briefcase was never rec uh, recovered. The back seats of the plane were never recovered. I, I tried to get, a, uh, get my hands on that plane for uh, about six months and they wouldn't let me have it. Uh, but I suspect that the reason the back seat was missing is because that's probably where the bomb was. I'm sure the farmer says there was a flash, there was an explosion. 
the official version of the National Transportation Safety Board was the plane fell apart in the air. Okay. They do that all the time. What was it, Wellstone, his plane crashed too, didn't he? Uh, that's one of their favorite ways of getting rid of the, these people. Uh, airplane crash, automobile crashes. Catherine Sorensen on the Franklin cover-up case, who was the first complainant, uh, she uh, had a pattern of taking her foster kids on the same route to school every morning and this one particular day after she filed a complaint, uh, she's driving along, she comes up behind two little old ladies doing five miles an hour on a two-lane highway. At the last minute, the two little old ladies cut off to the right and a car comes 70, 75 miles an hour and, and, and hits her dead end, head, head, head end. And of course she died, so they got rid of her that way. Uh, anyway, as an outgrowth of the Franklin cover-up case, we learned that these kids, there were kids being kidnapped in Washington, D.C. I'm telling you very briefly about this case. I really got a lot to cover, and I can't cover it all. You can get it on my DVD, so. So um, in 1987, uh, March of 87, there were two adults and five young children who were noted in a park in Tallahassee, Florida. The adults were very well dressed. The children skimpily dressed. The police went down and talked to the kids. They said they were on their way to Washington, to uh, Mexico for a smart school. The kids didn't know how to use telephones, didn't know how to use the toilet, said they were living in the van, and they were only being fed uh, when they would, uh, were, uh, they weren't being fed on a regular basis, only being fed uh, when they were behave, would behave themselves. And the car, the van was traced to Washington, D.C. The two men were very well dressed. And long story short, the Metropolitan Police Department, Washington, D.C., obtained a search warrant on the, this was an organization known as the Finders, and they learned that uh, from the search warrant that uh, there were uh, children being kidnapped by this group. They were being transported all over the world. Uh, there was information in their computer about terrorism and explosives and bank transfers. Uh, they talked about children from China and Hong Kong and from the Middle East and from Europe uh, and so on and so forth. Um, they also talked, the Metropolitan Police Department said that there were indications that there had been some satanic activity in this same location. The, uh, I have a copy of the U.S. Department of the Treasury Customs Report. Okay, I obtained a copy of this and they did an investigation. They were called into the case because uh, they thought maybe there was some pornography involved. And I'm going to just read uh, the last page of the report to you. I have a copy right here. And this is the uh, customs agent going over to the Metropolitan Police for a final briefing on the case. I was, quote, I was advised that all the passport data had been turned, o turned over to the State Department for their investigation. The State Department, in turn, advised Metropolitan Police Department that all travel and use of the passports by the holders of the passport was within the law and no action would be taken. This included travel to Moscow, North Korea, and Vietnam, North Vietnam, from the late 1950s to the mid-1970s. Now, it was against the law to travel in those countries during that period. The individual, meaning, meaning a Metropolitan Police Department officer, advised this customs agent, further advised me of circumstances which indicated that the investigation into the activity of the finders had become a CIA internal matter. The Metropolitan Police Department has been class report has been classified secret, was not available for review. I was advised that the FBI had withdrawn from the investigation several weeks prior, and the FBI's FBI Foreign Counterintelligence Division had directed the Metropolitan Police Department not to advise the FBI Washington Field Office of anything that had transpired. No further information will be available. No further action will be taken. No further action will be taken on the basis of this report. Well, now, why am I bringing this to your attention when I'm talking about the FBI? It's very simple. This report has been furnished by me to the FBI on at least a half a dozen times with a formal request that an investigation be conducted. I have yet to be contacted by the FBI for more details. I have additional details. This is their responsibility. I was involved in kidnapping cases. This is an international child kidnapping ring. In my research, I learned this has been going on since the late, uh, since the early 1960s. I've also learned in my, in my research that this is an Illuminati operation and that they have vans throughout the United States that are picking kids up off the street. And if you'll check the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children uh, website, you will see that there are 91 adults 
disappear in this country every hour. 85 to 90 percent of these are children, estimated. Now, I did a chart. I charted, you know, these National Center of Mission Exploited pictures, they send these little cards, they must send millions of them out. And, and they've been in business for 25 years. And as of a year ago last fall, by the way, last year they took in $49 million. And as of a year ago last fall, they had located 139 children in 25 years. Not a very good record, is it? And recently I noticed that they quit putting that figure on their cards. But anyway, I, I had 94 of these cards myself. I've been collecting them. I'm a, I collect everything. I got 300 boxes of research in my home, by the way. It fills up a whole bedroom. And I've been doing this ever since college. And uh, so I, 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 I charted the date that these children were missing of the 94 cards that I have. And half of them, 47, exactly 47, were missing during the months of June, October, December. Now, if you check the satanic calendar, I have a satanic calendar available to you at my booth, by the way. You check the satanic calendar, the main three holidays where they sacrifice humans are the summer solstice, June 21st, Halloween, October 31st, and December 31st, 21st, December 21st, this winter solstice. So I contend, and I told the FBI this, that these children are being kidnapped by this CIA operation and being sacrificed by the Satanists, and it's being covered up. Anyway, nobody's paid much attention to me. I just keep preaching it, shouting from the rooftops, whatever. Going on to the terrorist movement. I've personally been involved in the terrorist movement. In uh, 1993, you recall October 20, or, uh, February 26, 1993, the World Trade Center car bombing. I have a New York Times article here, October 28, 1993. You don't have to take my word for it. But in the trial of the terrorists, uh, Adam Yosef was the leader, of course. He's serving prison time right now, Terminal Island, California. In the trial, it came out that the FBI had an informant named Salem, 43-year-old former Egyptian army officer. And he was in with the terrorists, and he was commissioned by the terrorists to put the car bomb together to bomb the World Trade Center. And he went to his FBI superiors, we're going to use a dummy bomb, aren't we? And the FBI superior says, no, we're going to use a real bomb. So the FBI not only knew about this in advance, they furnished the ingredients for the bomb that brought down uh, a portion of the, or badly damaged, six floors of the uh, World Trade Center car bombing. There were six people killed, there, was a million, there were a thousand injuries, and I think a half million dollars in damage. It's in here. And the reason that they, this came out in the trial is because Salem uh, was, uh, he, he furnished, the FBI furnished him a body mic when he met with the terrorists. Well, he was smart enough to use a body mic when he met, met with the FBI. So uh, that way he did not have to serve any time. I'm sure they would have railroaded him along with the other terrorists if he hadn't done this. Came out during the trial. New York Times, October 28, 1993. Don't take my word for it. Look it up. Oklahoma City bombing, April 19, 1995. I was uh, up to my eyeballs in that one. I made two trips to Oklahoma City out of my pocket. Investigated, I have a 222-page report. It's available, by the way. And I learned in my work that that statement by the government that this was an ammonia nitrate bomb that would blow up a stump in your backyard if you're a farmer <laughs> was a joke. Okay, that bomb, and I can document this, was a highly classified bomb developed in the early 1980s and it was so highly classified that Ronnie Reagan put it in a storage someplace and said, don't talk about it to anybody that was involved in it. I happen to know about the fact that the bomb was ex exploded in Area 51. The night it was exploded there, I was with a group of uh, people in Palm Springs. We were in a hotel room waiting to see what the results were. These are intelligence-type individuals. I do have uh, a few friends around. 
uh, not many, but a few in the business. And we learned that a tech, it, was, it was underestimated, a technician died and another technician was injured. It was so powerful. The contract number on that bomb, and I've got it here, I, I developed it from a Defense Daily magazine, and it is DAAA 21-90-C-0045, and it was finalized uh, in the government contract uh, and uh, signed off on June the 14th, 1990. I wrote a letter to the Picatinny Arsenal. Picatinny Arsenal has uh, the uh, all contracts with the government available to the public. I received a response back. In response to your request, uh, amended, uh, amended Freedom Information Act, request for a copy of contract number so and so forth after review research of your request, Please be advised that no information pertaining to that contract number has been located. If you have any questions, please call us. I wrote a letter to Dinah Nobel. Dinah Nobel happens to be the manufacturer of that particular bomb. Never got a response back. I wrote that uh, September the 21st. Firehouse Magazine. Uh, the editor of Firehouse Magazine wrote this article. And in the article, he points out that, by the way, the information he obtained was from the Oklahoma City Fire Department. He points out that there were four unexploded devices taken out of the building. The, he has the, uh, the date and the, uh, and the time that they were taken out. The rescue attempts were uh, discontinued for five hours while men in blue uh, work clothes came in and carried boxes out. Bill Clinton, in a speech, uh, and this appeared in the American Free Press. If you didn't subscribe to it while you're here, you should. June the 12th, 1995, while speaking in Na Hanover, New Hampshire, said the bomb that blew up the federal building in Oklahoma City was a miracle of technology. So now we find out that ammonia nitrate bombs are a miracle of technology. Okay. I learned, because of the work that I did in Oklahoma City, the defense team interviewed me for four and a half hours. And... Um, I learned that uh, through my other sources, an inside investigator, that there were at least 11 other people involved in Oklahoma City. And now most recently, uh, Terry Nichols has identified the person who coordinated the Oklahoma City bombing as Larry Potts, number two man in the FBI. Uh, I have a lot, I only have about six or seven more minutes, so I've got to skip over quite a bit of my plans here. Uh, so what's happened to me? Well, 911, I was going to go over 911. I have uh, documented proof that the FBI was furnished information in advance about 911 on March the uh, 20th, 2001. And at that time, my source, who was a CIA for some 20 years, uh, furnished the information to FBI agent Keith Kutry of the Williamsport, Pennsylvania Resident Agency and specifically told him who was coordinating forthcoming terrorist attacks. The United States had information on the movement of Soviet-made shoulder fire missiles, was coordinating forthcoming skyjacking, coordinating bombings, and the espionage knew the identity of sleepers in the United States. My source furnished the FBI with an Arab who was in with the terrorists who was preparing false IDs for 4,500 terrorists around the world. The FBI interviewed him after 9-1-1, Mr. Kutry did, and threatened him with prosecution and deported him. He and his family have since been executed. Um, okay, I only have a couple of minutes. Uh, I said earlier there's a covert overt operation. I also said that there are a lot of good people in the FBI and CIA NSA. I'm in the process now of preparing a, a report for the Senate Intelligence Committee. And I want to just give you the introduction to this report. Based on my 28 years experience, I'm reading from my report. And research, I've determined there are thousands of victims who have been targeted by an illegal U.S. government rogue criminal enterprise that is active 24 hours a day throughout the United States. And networks of victims who work with me have reached the same conclusion based on one, their personal experiences, two, the significant number of victims, and three, the extent and intensity of the harassment. It is far too active to be operated and controlled by private enterprise. Private enterprise goals are to achieve financial gain. 
These operations require extensive financing to operate with no return on the investment. I believe these programs are financed through illegal black operations, i.e. drugs, prostitution, gambling, kidnapping children who are auctioned off as sex slaves. Paul Benassi told me he attended uh, six such auctions with as many as two, as three, excuse me, as many as six and as many as 36 children being auctioned off at $50,000 each, by the way. Um, kidnapped children who are auctioned off as sex slave, used as humans in human sacrifice and body parts. I believe this well-organized, sophisticated operation has a central command located somewhere in the United States with multiple satellite offices scattered throughout the country. It appears that the, those who administer the program can call any location in the U.S. for surveillance, a telephone tap or other activity, and harassment directed at a victim and immediately dispense manpower to the source. This has happened to me, by the way, time and time again. This well-greased, covert operation makes the old FBI counterintelligence program look like a Sunday school class. I can document that the government has the expertise, finance, and manpower to effectively administer such a program. To understand why and how a black criminal enterprise of this rogue element targets an individual is necessary, one, to identify the victim, two, outline the reasons the victim is targeted, and three, document and identify the weapons and tactics being directed against him or her. Okay, I only have a couple of minutes, uh, but I think I started late, so I may take a little extra minute of your time on that one. So what about me? People say, why aren't you dead? Okay, well, let me tell you this. Uh, in the early 1980s, I had three occasions when gunmen were waiting for me. I, know, I found out afterwards, and it's only through divine intervention that I didn't go to specific locations at the time. Uh, for example, one of them, I didn't go home that particular night. The landlady said that she was parking her car at 1.30 in the morning. Two men were in the car across from my front door. One of them got out of the car and came over and said, you know where Ted Gunnerson lives? And they said, no. Or she said, no. And I, of course, told her, of course, told her, if anybody asks about me, you don't know me. And he sat in the car 15 more minutes, quarter to two, he left. I made some phone calls the next day. The next day when I came home, and um, I found out I had it on me. And I, I made, I went in and see some certain people, got that hit taken off, and I learned that there was a second hit on me uh, by satanic cults out of uh, Florida and Houston. And I was a little upset about the first hit. It was by the Israeli mafia, by the way, because of a case I'd worked, an attempted assassination of a businessman. I was upset because I found out that uh, uh, it was a hit for $25,000. I thought I'd at least be worth 100000 <laughs> XFBI FBI chief and all that. Anyway, uh, I had, in addition to hit men waiting for me, I had three FBI investigations of me. I, I, I submitted uh, freedom information requests. I received copies back of some of the pages, but they were nebulous. I might as well have thrown them in the wastebasket. But it was kind of interesting because at the end of each report it said, Ted Gunderson should be considered armed and dangerous. They should have added with knowledge, okay? I had a girl named Pam Fawcett. The FBI and the DEA uh, commissioned her to try to set me up on a drug deal. It didn't work after six months. I was trying to help her, give her advice on her 14-year-old son who was in trouble in Florida. After six months, Pam came to me and said, uh, told me the whole story, how she had run to the Modesto, California office, FBI office. She'd come and go. She had her own coffee cup. They'd given her $2,000 to try to get me, okay? And I said to Pam, I said, Pam, and I gave her a polygraph. She passed. I said, Pam, why are you coming to my side now? And she said, well, I woke up the other morning, and I realized you're the only honest son of a bitch I've talked to in six months. Those were her exact words. <laughs> so I took a signed statement from Pam, put her on tape, sent it to Buck Ravel, number two man in the FBI at the time, who used to work for me in Philadelphia. He was the head of the bank robbery squad. And I told, the, I told Buck and the FBI, I said, you guys, I said, first you try to get me, prosecute me in uh, Dallas. It's right here in Dallas, by the way. Uh, with your investigation, three investigations, and all, I was uh, two days away from being indicted by a grand jury here, by the way. That's another story, and I don't have time to tell it. I said, first you try to get me for, in Dallas, and now you set this girl up on me. I said, you guys are Bush. Now, for you ladies that don't know what that means, that means you're minor league, okay? Guys that know baseball know that's what it is. So what's, what else has happened to me? Oh, I've had surveillances on me uh, galore. I've had people planning on me, probably 18, 20 people planning on me in the last 
eight, 28 years. I've had burglaries. They've come into my house even when I'm asleep. Uh, they put a penny on the foot of my bed one night when I was there. Uh, one night I, I went to bed at midnight. I got up at 3 o'clock to relieve myself. My bathrobe when I went to bed was at the foot of my bed. And I got up and here's ceremonies laid out like a rug next to the bed. Uh, I've been a victim of cyber terrorism, threatening phone calls, hidden camera. I came home from a trip here within the last five or six weeks, month I guess it is. I was looking for a file on the table that I had in my uh, apartment, my house in uh, Claytonia, and I couldn't find it. I was looking through and looking through, and I had a phone call, 827 AM, and a male voice says, did you find the file? They had a camera in there, a hidden camera in there, but they have cameras now that are the size of the end of a pinpoint of a needle. I had threatening phone calls, cyber terrorism, hidden cameras, stole, my car's been stolen. I've had gang stalking on me, lug nuts removed, I've had flat tires, my window's been shot out twice, both times I was standing near the window. Uh, I have been, had TV surveillance of me, they can monitor you through cable television by the way, even if it's off. I've had threatening letters and most recently I've been the victim of a disinformation program by a guy named Stu Webb and other individuals, and Stu Webb is actually put out word that I was kicked out of the FBI for practicing satanic ceremonies in the federal building. Okay. And you, you know what? After that disinformation came out, my speaking tours were, came down to nothing, really. I was doing a lot of lectures before that. And we have enough idiots out there that believe this off the internet because it's on the internet that it really affected my opportunity to get the word out. But this is what they had in mind. It's called a disinformation program. And then the most recent thing, and I'm, I will close in just a minute. I have one minute left, but I was late starting, right? I wasn't? I was, yeah. <laughs> I was, okay. Well, I won't argue with you. Huh? Go for it. Go for it, okay. All right. There's no argument then. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, but uh, the latest thing to me is I moved a year ago last May. Excuse me yeah, a year ago last May, from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. I had a, a condominium there. I had, uh, next door was somebody I never saw, and across the hall was an individual who was a security guard. And I'm sitting at my desk, and I'm, I, I can't think. I don't know what's happening, I can't read, I can't do it. I realized that, that something's happening to me. Uh, a friend of mine came in about 11.30 at night, said, you're sick, call the paramedic. Paramedics came, took my blood pressure, get to the hospital. I had blood pressure of 242 over 119. And so I knew that there was a serious problem. I had blood tests and I had arsenic and cyanide in me. I was being poisoned and I knew this. Within two weeks, I left Las Vegas, called John DeCamp in Claytonia, Nebraska, and I said, John, I'm getting out of here. He said, come on back, I've got a place for you to stay. And I now live in Claytonia, Nebraska, about two blocks from John DeCamp. Anyway, I was being poisoned. And there's other stories about the poison. They've tried to poison me when I'm driving down the street. They have a device that they put in the back of a car and they pump the poison out and uh, you're behind it and you, you can't, they block you in. Uh, car in the front, car beside you, car behind you. Uh, but it hadn't worked because I've caught on to it. So, but anyway, I was being poisoned in Las Vegas in my condo and uh, I was able to overcome that. As soon as I moved, I, I just loaded up on vitamins and what have you. Okay, I was asked a few moments ago before I came on board, the reason for the terrorist movement, by the way, the reason for the terrorist movement is they create these terrorist acts, the government does this covert operation in order to hand, establish the homeland security and in order to write the Patriot Act, take away our constitutional rights and civil liberties. There are prison camps that have already been set up. There are railroad cars, three-tier railroad cars, and I've seen them personally, that have shackles in them. I didn't see the shackles, I saw the car. And there are big plans for the next terrorist attack, I think, to pick up a bunch of us in the red, blue, and green list and haul us off to these concentration camps. So, okay, now, uh, thank you very much. I want to urge all of you, uh, is there hope for our country? If we, if we, there's hope if we can elect Ron Paul. Okay, we need, we need to get Ron Paul out. Uh, so we need to work hard. Uh, I have a considerable amount of material. I'm, by the way, 
Uh, I have a, Ron, a lot of Ron Paul material that you can order through my catalog. In addition, I'm giving away free DVDs back there if you want to visit me. Uh, all you have to do is pay shipping and handling. I have over 400 DVDs I'm giving away, including information on, on Ron Paul and what have you. And of course, last, last but not least, I have, uh, you can order the Franklin cover-up book. Uh, we didn't discuss in detail pawns in the game. This is a book about the Illuminati, the 25 goals that were announced May the 1st, 1776 by Adam Bysaw to take over the world, and that includes uh, corruption of the youth through sex and drugs, and uh, of course, uh, control of the mainstream media, and about 85% of these goals are complete. Also, in my catalog is a uh, multi-level program about holy tea. The lady that put me into it, her first check the first month was $1,400. You might want to take a look at that, and thank you very much, sir. Thank you.